because an NFT collector cares about scarcity. Because of COVID, all the manufacturers wouldn't speak to us. Today, Bricktopians is known as very builder centric. Was it always that way? Let's say Pudgy just got into Walmart and that was like a part of the building in public series. Azuki goes, that's it, we're getting in Walmart. You are who you are today because you stacked skills. If I learn no new skills this year and I only focus on getting better at copywriting, that will create way more outsized returns than anything else that I could possibly do. The evolution of what people value in this market. If you were to run our collection on a laptop, it would take you 10 years just to load the NFTs. In the age of the internet, it's so easy to become commoditized. The difference between if people are connected to the fact that you do it or they're connected to the thing itself. You don't wait for the grand reveal to start marketing. Building and public is the marketing. I probably shouldn't say this, but... But hey, Alex, my man. It's good to see you, as always, brother. You're a builder, you're a content creator, and all around, man, you're a really cool guy. Really excited <laughs> to chatting about building Booktopian. Excited to chatting about, you know, what are the skills uh, that you would consider are the highest value skill that one should build in Web3, and really about your long-term vision of how you see the Web3 space evolving and all the opportunities that are going to be opening up as it evolves. But before everything, man, a little bit about you. You are the founder of Bricktopians, a project since that was that's been live since 2021. You've been early mm -hmm. on that. Can you give us a little bit of a of a of a historical background? What are the series of events that led you to launching Bricktopians, and what was that journey like? Yeah, so it's actually it's an eight year journey to get to this point. Um, I've been in Web three for eight years, which is kind of a, an insane thing to think about because. Um, almost okay. feels like Web3 hasn't been around for eight years, right? Um, but when I, <laughs> when I um, first graduated high school in 2014, um, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I was one of those kids in school that was like the type of person that works their ass off on the things that they care about. And if you were trying to make me do something, I didn't want anything to do with it. Like I would find a way to hack the system. I was very much a work smarter, not harder type individual. Oh, yeah. um, but... It's funny how if you would ask some of my early high school teachers if Alex would go anywhere, they'd probably say no because I just didn't seem like the kid that worked hard. And then if you ask any of my friends now, like what describe Alex, it's like, oh, he's got no life. He does nothing but work. He's working 24 seven. And I, I think that's like a very big, um, it just was one of those things that was in my DNA. I always knew I wanted to create something for myself and go down that road. But what was really interesting was in 2015, the, the revolution was really built around apps. That was like the kind of the opportunity landscape of the time. Mobile apps is what I'm talking about. And you'd always hear some like 15 year old just creates an app and sells it to Yahoo. And I was very excited by that sort of opportunity because it was very much the, the intersection of like everything up until that point was... Um, yeah, I think it's in Y Combinator, they talk about bits, not atoms. Like everything up, up until that point was physical, physical distribution, all these sorts of things. But it was really exciting because this was the beginning of zero marginal cost per unit sold of like a product, right? Like, so if you made an app that really resonated with people, it could reach a million people without taking a million units of cost to reach that individual. And so I just was like really excited by this idea. It's like, okay, cool. If I create something awesome that resonates with people, I can like create something massive and global. Um, but as I started to go down that road, I realized I was actually at the end of the bell curve of distribution and adoption in, in app development. It was very saturated at that point in time. My dad came home to me one day and he'd just been at like some lunch um, at work. And he said, Hey, like, um, I learned about this thing today called blockchain. Like, I don't know a lot about it, but I think you should pay attention to it. Like, you don't really listen to me, but this is one you probably want to listen to. So I was like, okay, cool. And I, I went away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I went away and I watched a YouTube video. I literally like typed into YouTube, what is blockchain? And the only video at the time had like seven or 13,000 views. And it was like very much like old school PowerPoint style, like, it felt like an old science, like when your teacher is like away in like science class and they like put on a movie, it felt like that. And it was like a blockchain, like a block is a series of transactions that is minted and hashed every like 12 minutes, da 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 da, da. And, but through some of the nuances of that video and a couple others that I watched, I could start to see that there were all these opportunities 
but they were being communicated terribly. It was like, whoa, there's this like blue ocean of app development, but literally only the people that are excited about it right now are people that are tech centric. And I always considered myself someone that's people centric. And so I was like, if I can understand the individual and how to communicate it to them, how to market it to them, how to build for them, not care about necessarily tech first, because I think we still see that in the NFT and Web3 landscape is everyone gets excited about the next new chain or the next new like way of approaching things or the next new token standard, which is great. But most people just don't think about it from the human first. And so I got really excited and got into it more from like a hobby perspective for those two years. I went to every event that I could in my country. I eventually ran out of those. I saved up, bought a ticket overseas, went to some events in New York, which was amazing. I got to meet Joe Lubin, the co-founder of Ethereum before that was like a massive thing when he was still like running a small office for consensus in Brooklyn and New York. And naturally found my way getting involved as an early investor was really um wearing that hat for a couple years got burnt by my first bull and bear market and really had that sour taste in my mouth that i think many of us get and from around 2018 to 2019 i was like yeah this i'm just going to pay attention to this from a distance i'm not really interested in this anymore and then COVID hit and i was like and all these investment opportunities were arising and it was just very much uh, i consider myself very lucky that i was like okay, I don't know anything about stocks, but I know Ethereum structurally hasn't changed. I'm just going all in on Ethereum again. And so I I went that second round and put that second innings in on something I felt confident behind because every time I I made an investment, even after one of my biggest regrets was not making an investment after the original Ethereum fork back in 2016, because the way I always make decisions is if the inherent thesis hasn't changed but some external conditions have that's usually what produces a a great buying opportunity and so when COVID happened it's like well it's not like ethereum's technology change and so i was just like that's it i'm going all in and what's really cool is that kind of was the genesis point of bricktopians um and i'll get to how that comes full circle in a minute but then 2021 rolls around and my best friend, uh, I'll give him full credit for this. He's actually downstairs. Um, he came to me and he said, um, hey, have you checked out NBA Top Shot? And I was like, no, what's that? Like, that sounds really interesting. And I'm a massive NBA fan. Obviously, I'm a massive blockchain fan. And for me, that was the light bulb moment. That was like the intersection of blockchain and culture. That's where people weren't talking about the technology. They were talking about owning a digital like trading card and people were justifying it from the use case perspective. They were talking about what it means. It's like, what, what, so uh, my favorite conversation would always be, so do you own the rights to that video and you get a royalty on it? No, no, I don't own the rights. I just own it like a trading card. I own that video. Like that's what I own and I collect it. And people were starting to come online with this mindset of digital ownership. And that in 2021, I was just like, okay, this is it. This is what I'm going all in on. Um, I'm like burning the boats. I'm going to find a way to do something in this space. And so what's really funny is, and I know we'll get into it, but we actually started with our thre- with our sneaker, the Brain Boot. So there's actually an article written about us in May, 2021. This is way before Bricktopians. We were like one of the earliest to this because um, my current co-founder, he came to me and he said, hey, Alex, I really want to create this innovative sneaker concept. And I was obsessed with this idea of physicalization on the blockchain around March, 2021. And I said, there's this really interesting mechanism that we could play on that I think would really be quite disruptive, which was this idea where you have an NFT and you burn it to get the physicals because an NFT collector cares about scarcity, right? They want to see something that gets rarer over time, the NFT collectible. Yes. Yeah. Whereas a sneaker collector, what they care about is authenticity and like that feeling of exclusivity and maybe transparency around supply. And I was like, you can play off both mindsets and actually create a really unique collectible use case. So we started that in May, 2021. And then because of COVID, all the manufacturers wouldn't speak to us. Like they were backlogged on their current clients. No one was available and we had to put that project on ice. But then around July, 2021, we started to see the PFP revolution. Like all the PFPs were starting to take over. And this was the, this to me was the one where I was like, okay, 
like the kind of like the sea is parted. This is the opportunity to go all in on. And I said to my co-founder, I was like, this is your skill set, um, 3D art. And I understand blockchain, how the mentality of this space works and marketing in Web3. Let's like join forces on this and go all in because I think we could create something really unique here. And I know there's a lot of threads that we're going to pull on in this space, but it's kind of, I, we burn the boats. I bet all the ETH that I had saved up over several years to pull off the project, he worked his ass off. And now what's really cool is even like the brain boot and everything that we were already creating um, independently has been brought into this, our project Bricktopians. And it's all kind of like um, bearing its fruit now and is what we're evolving into in um, this year and the years to come. Man, what a fantastic story. That was, that was such <laughs> a good story. Uh, such a good lead up. Today, Bricktopians is known as a smart project, very builder centric. Was it always that way? And my question really relates towards what was the main marketing communication methods and branding that you were using when that was out there? Because in a year and a half, or almost two years now, things evolve a lot. Yeah, so there, there's really been two phases to us. So the way, I, for anyone that doesn't understand what a Bricktopian is, like if you know, if you've ever seen my posts, it's the NFTs that we post in our GMs. And they're the only um, NFT collection where it's in 3D and every single NFT moves in its own unique way. Like if you look at the bricks, you can see the reflections from one brick to another in motion in the way that they move. And this was like, to anyone that understands 3D art, this was like a um, monumental technological feat. This took, like I always tell people, if you were to load our collection on a laptop, like normally you, you run a script to splice layers when you're creating an NFT. If you were to run our collection on a laptop, it would take you 10 years just to load the NFTs. We had to have like an entire Man. farm of graphics cards running 24 seven for five weeks straight, like a room full of graphics cards to create the collection. So the way that we describe what we do is um, we're a brand that's built on building the impossible so that our holders will have something that will never ever be replicated and they'll never see anywhere else. So. That's very much like the ethos of what we've created and kind of like our mentality behind what we build. And what's been really cool is that we kind of knew that when we were born, we were born during an era where there was mainly 2D NFTs and the beginning of 3D NFTs. So I would say we were very fortunate in that when we were launching, the way that the market evaluated value was based on um, quality. And so our quality really stood out amongst everything else that was... Um, being presented. I don't think our strategy could be replicated right now because it's what matters more than the product itself is understanding your customer base or your user base or your holder base in an NFT context. So at that time, we knew people that were evaluating art against art. And when they saw our art, it stood out very heavily amongst the rest. Whereas now I would say um, what people value is transparency of founders, business plan, clear roadmap and um, uh, path to market outside of Twitter. All of these things are how people evaluate decisions right now. And that's very much being championed by the Pudgy Penguins meta. But in terms of um, practically how we marketed, the difference is back then I was very fortunate in that as a hobby, I had been growing an Instagram page to like just share news on NFTs. And what I really loved about my Instagram page was that all these other NFT pages were taking paid promotions I never took a single one. And so it became a really trusted source of news and media in the NFT space, especially given the fact that um, on Instagram, it was the beginning of the mainstream finding out about NFTs. And we all think that everyone lives on Twitter, but I promise you, ask most of your friends, yes. are you on Twitter? Are you keeping track of things on Twitter? Most of them aren't. And something clicked for me. Like the reason I started the Instagram page in the first place was I was like, wait, hold on, I get that Twitter is the home of NFTs, but NFTs are a very visual product. Um, why is the most visual medium not the main source of where people are finding out about this stuff? So I, I went in on that early. And so what was great though, from uh, for us from a marketing perspective is that became like the, the main acquisition channel, especially at the beginning, because we had such a trusted audience. And I like we're here as a project two years later, 
I knew what our intentions were from the very beginning in the way that we wanted to um, deliver on our promises and actually be a project for the future. So I could market that good conscience and good faith, knowing that we deliver on our promises. Whereas what was happening on the other pages was we were seeing all these like, random spin-off animal or ape collections getting promoted 24 7 people thinking it's going to be the next board ape them getting burnt and that those pages essentially fading away into nothing um so i think it was a combination of having a really strong trusted audience at the beginning and if if you even think about the way i approach my content now it's all about i'm not trying to sell anything today i'm not trying to push anything too heavily all i'm doing is building trust and a relationship with an audience and then what I love is that one day, if I have something that I truly believe in, that I back, that I want to push um, and share with the world, I know that that audience is going to care about it because we've developed a relationship together. And so I think that's the something really important that's missed in content. Like you learn this from like Gary Vee and Alex Hermosi and all of those guys is that like so many people create content or grow an audience or whatnot. And they're like, they're just going... I'll give you something. I want something in return. I'll give you something. I'm going to try and sell you something. But um, yeah, like we, uh, I take it the exact opposite approach, which is I have no idea what I'm going to do in the future. We're just going to give you guys as much value as possible. And I hope when I create something that you're going to like it as well. You touched on something that I find very interesting, which is the evolution of what people value in this market. Back then you said people used to value the quality of the project, the quality of the art. And today this has changed to valuing the path to market, the transparency of the business model, as well as the founder profile and the founder background. Can you touch a little bit more on that and expand on that? Yeah, 100%. And I might be a little bit biased in this insight, but it's something that's definitely worked for us and is something that is built on an observation that I experienced in NFT, NFT LA and NFT NYC in 2022. So about a year ago now. And that was when I was at those events, it just felt like everyone was so aggressively self-promoting right? Like everyone was there to sell you something. They were, they wanted to tell you about their project. They wanted to tell you about why they were special and why you needed to buy from them, but they weren't actually like really connecting with you or giving you anything upfront or in return. And it just became so obvious to me, um, especially when we started to see the emergence of, of um, people like Frank and Wab on the timeline. If you think about like any great product that we love, right? Like all the best Nike shoes, all, um, the best like clothing labels, all of that, we often associate with individuals and teams and, uh, and feeling connected to the people actually behind these things, right? Um, and so what I'd basically yeah. decided was I was like, okay, I'm a nobody in Web3. I had about 2,000 followers at the time. Uh, this was like July last year. I'm like, but I've launched a project. I've consulted in the space. I feel like I've learned a lot from my investments over the past eight years. I feel like I have something that I can offer this space. And that's not me saying, hey, here's all the reasons why you should buy a Bricktopian. That's just me going, hey, I want to show you why I have a strong, clear vision for what I'm doing here in Web3 and how Bricktopians relates to that. And so I just relentlessly started sharing as much value as possible, just thinking, how can I help the person that's reading this as much as possible, not make the mistakes I've made, leapfrog some of the lessons I've learned, accelerate their success. And what I experienced was you always hear about it, but you don't realize it until you actually do it. How if you just give whatever you have to give, it will come back around to whatever your business is, right? So in, in our case, our business is Bricktopians. And so if I, what I found was if I gave threads, wrote threads about investment, I'd get DMs from people saying, Hey, Alex, I've really enjoyed your threads on investment and I've enjoyed your past few threads. Um, I just bought a Bricktopian today. I want to support you. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And seeing that, that proof over the past year and how that kind of creates this positive feedback loop, it's insane. And like, I've even experienced it as a buyer, right? Like I'm a massive fan of Zeneca. I think he's a net positive for the space. Um, I, I, I really like his attitude and the way that he approaches uh, pragmatically Web3. And so I just bought one of his NFTs just because I'm like, hey, he's a good dude. This is someone I want to support, someone I want to champion. Someone when someone checks out my wallet, I want to show that I'm supporting that person. And I think we underrate that side of NFTs a lot. And um, 
so yeah it's just very much from observation and experience that i've noticed that but the other thing is um one extra quick note on that is it's really challenging i know that we're working really aggressively on the brain boot but maybe january to june as someone that was that felt very much like i was running a company right we were building very aggressively but if you're not making any noise about the fact that you're building with so many people that just rug in the space and people say that they're building but they actually don't deliver anything it's a really tense relationship for your holders to not feel that sense of connection to the individual like this person is here right and even just by being more active it gives my community a sense of totally oh alex is here alex is showing up alex is a part of this web3 ecosystem alex is getting us speaking opportunities with leon to be able to share the bricktopian story right like they, these are the sorts of things that I think a lot of projects are missing. And I think there are founders with good intentions that don't want to be public. In this kind of market, it's just not good enough. You need to be out there and you need to be making people feel at ease that you're actually going to deliver on the promises that you set out. Since Alex's building that had 2,000 followers sold out an NFT collection to Alex's building today, arguably one of the top content creators in the space, there's, you've clearly put a lot of effort in your content production game and your personal branding. And you said from observation that all these had a positive impact. What I want to do right now is to try to quantify those observations that you had. For instance, for me, I've noticed a direct relationship with the, the quantity of content that I put out on YouTube and on X and the audience growth I get from that. Two times the number of YouTube output, two times the growth size of my audience. For you, how has your growth as a public figure on X impacted the project? The number one way I would say it's impacted the project from a public standpoint is almost every person that has purchased this year. And I don't like to take credit because I think it can't be overstated how important the presence of a community is in actually being the amplifier. It's almost like we're in a concert and I might be the lead guitarist, but they're the megaphones and the speakers that, that get that message out there and really Got blast it. it. But something that I've experienced, and I can say this with absolute confidence, that 95% of the people who have bought a Bricktopian this year have bought as a result of seeing me active on Twitter, which is kind of crazy, right? Like it's people that I can recognize and name and that I've developed a relationship with. I've spoken on a space with They're people that comment on all my posts and they message me and they're like, Alex, I just want to let you know, like, I can't believe I didn't have a Bricktopian sooner. I actually thought I already had one. I'm jumped in. I want to support you. We've got to support the real builders in the space. And I think about that a lot, right? Because you got to think of it, what would the opposite be? Like, what would the, the inverse of this be? The inverse would be releasing something every six months or so or every three months or whatever cycle your project is on and saying nothing in between. And I think what we've learned is the delivery of the piece that people are looking forward to is actually not generally what causes the most project growth, right? Like, the anticipation of the Azuki event, although obviously um, that went a little bit differently to how people expected, the anticipation was what drove the most interest in that. The anticipation of almost every piece of delivery that we've seen in Web3 is what draws the attention. And that comes from the megaphones. I'd say um, like if you go through the activity log of people buying Bricktopians for the first time, the, the awesome thing that has made me really excited to keep being aggressive on the content side is just seeing the new people that join our community. That was such a good sentence, by the way, I had to write it down. The community is the megaphone, and all you are is the guitarist on stage. I'd like to read us two posts bookmarked, and I want to read those. The first one is from you. The second one is from another very highly respected founder. Alex is building. The reason I build in public is because it has hidden benefits that most people miss out on. You build with your users instead of for your users. This makes the product so much better. Number two, you don't wait for the grand reveal to start marketing. Building in public is the marketing. So that's what you said. Now we have Pons, the founder of The Plague, said something very different. Yeah, than what legend. You believe. And he said, in the end, full respect to Pons, incredible builder. I uh, had the chance to hop on a Twitter spaces with him last time. He said, in the end, I think we will find that when you weigh the pros and cons of NFT projects building in publics, the cons far outweigh 
the pros. Or maybe the issue is that you only are building in public to a point. Unless you're going to signal to your competitors everything you are doing, you can't show what is going on behind the scenes. So Pons has a very much different view that building in public actually can hurt the brand and the IP and the, the trade secrets of what is it that you have. So what are your thoughts on this topic? I obviously take the opposing view. I think there's more benefits than cons because here's the reality, right? 99% of NFT projects will fail. Like they're going to die. And someone replicating what you're doing is very unlikely going to be the reason that you don't succeed. So let's say Pudgy just got into Walmart and that was like a part of the building in public series, um, which it actually was, it was, but that was after the fact. And some other project goes, Azuki goes, that's it. We're getting in Walmart. Like we're going to go and do that. I don't think, and I understand, I appreciate the fact that that, that is a, an after the fact situation, but even if they were speaking about it in advance and talking through the negotiations and being more public about that, I think it's unlikely that another project would be the reason that Pudgy wouldn't succeed in that instance. And I'm actually going to call out something that is completely outside of Web3 as what I think is one of the best examples of why building in public is so amazing. And it's actually... It's inspired my recent series of videos and my recent series of videos are me just experimenting so I can bring more of that into the Bricktopian side of what we're doing. But there's this um, Instagrammer called, uh, I've forgotten his name, but he runs a, a company called Blanked Studios. And what it is, is he basically, he shows his design process. He's like, is essentially creating like homewares that are made out of metallic finishes. So he has like a cup that looks like it's been punched in a little bit and it's got like a mercury finish to it. And he's got these like teardrop um, pieces that hang off the corner of tables that are made out of like a metallic um, substance. Um, I think uh, they're made out of steel. I could be wrong. He also makes coat hangers, all these sorts of things. He shares every step of him designing these things tweaking them when he goes to the factory and it's not working what he considers from an electronic standpoint when he's making his lamp oh shit i used the wrong chord like uh now i've got to go back to the drawing board i got to figure out a different chord when i put it in this room it looks stupid so then i went back to the computer now i'm animating it in 3d etc 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 and he just sold out of his cup that he just launched right now, the inverse strategy would be to make the best cup that you can possibly make and then tell people when it's ready and start advertising it like crazy. But he didn't even need to. He just opened up and everyone wanted to be a part of it. And I think particularly for smaller projects, like we're much more of an emerging project compared to some of the more established ones. If someone wants to come along and make a brain boot because we're making a brain boot and wants to use the same technology and replicate our process that has taken us a year to get to, go for it. Like that is completely fine. But what I don't think people realize is that when you build in public, by the time the idea is validated, you already have the audience, right? Like an idea is just an idea. There are no good ideas and bad ideas. There are only validated ideas. And if you go out and everyone has been saying, Alex, I love the brain boot. I love what you guys are doing. I love what you guys are doing. I love what you guys are doing. If some other project comes along and goes, we're also making a brain boot. Everyone's just going to go, no, that's, that's Alex and Bricktopians. Like, what are you doing? That looks ridiculous. It obviously depends product to product, but I think particularly for emerging brands, it's actually a massive David and Goliath strategy. Like it is extremely advantageous to show your work. The thing is in the age of the internet, it's so easy to become commoditized. Everything is permissionless. Before, back in the days, if you were listed at Walmart, I was like, wow, like you've gone through heavy filtering. But today, anyone can sell their products anyway with a Shopify store. You no longer need the permission or gatekeeper, access to a gatekeeper for you to showcase your product. So I think in a world where every single product you have, every idea, I'm sure there are hundreds of brands out there, Alex, that are building 3D shoes. But what separates these brands is the story behind that. And the best way to suck your customers into a story is to show them the brand during the building stages. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway, but the, a lot of uh, what I more mean is like, I don't want to invite competition. That's where this line is going. But I, on this Web3 job stuff, the jobs that I've been sharing, I have been building in public. I've been sharing these jobs publicly. I've created a newsletter that I only started a week ago, um, or I technically opened a month ago and did the first edition of a week ago. And I shared videos on how I'm automating it 
and I showed how I automate it to make it take me less than, uh, I think it's um, just, I've got it just under an hour to actually create the newsletter. And technically there is no reason that someone who's in my audience couldn't go, that's a great idea. And then just go and do it themselves. But what I have yeah. confidence in is the fact that what number one, there is kind of like a, and this is kind of unique to web three Twitter. There is a level of ethics and kind of, we all, choose to not step on each other's toes if someone has really carved out a niche for themselves everyone goes that's their niche like that i'm not going to go over there and and try and do that unless it's more of an homage or transformative or whatever but i get the benefit of my users telling me what i need to improve people seeing flaws in my process and telling me how to make it even better and people signing up when they watch the videos that's way better than the, the downside risk of someone going, oh, I'm also going to do a jobs newsletter. There are so many job boards out there that are already out competing me. I'm not worried about some new person coming along and kind of stealing that thunder, if that makes sense. So there, there are instances where I think building in public is a no-brainer, but I do, I do understand where Pons is coming from. Like if you've come along and you've said, like let's say Azuki with um, physically backed tokens, right? Like if that's, the type of idea where it's like, if you're saying this is going to be something unique that we are really building, it is, it's kind of like the idea itself. I think you touched on it really well, Leon, where it's like the difference between if people are connected to the fact that you do it or they're connected to the thing itself, right? Like if, if the piece itself is so valuable in itself could be taken by someone else and no one would care and they just use it anyway, then maybe yeah. there's a little bit of a higher risk. But I just live in a bit of more of a world where the things that I try try to build are pretty closely associated with my brand as an individual as well. So, and there always is a play. At the end of the day, it's all a game. It's a game of marketing. There is always a play for speculation. There is room for leaving mystery, leaving gaps. You never want to close. There's this thing I'm I'm learning more and more about storytelling, and there's this concept that is very much used in series and movies, which is which are called open loops. The way you keep someone watching 10 hours of Lord of the Rings from, you know, sequel one all the way to the third one, the way you get them to come back and want to keep discovering what is happening to the story is by always leaving open loops. The main character faces a challenge at the beginning of the show, which only gets closed at the end of it. And you want to know what happens. So there is that element. You always want to leave that air of mystery in your project. You want to, you never want to give an answer to every question you open but let's pivot a little bit uh, 10 degrees you've clearly done a lot of studying alex at every level you're a fantastic speaker fantastic copywriter fantastic content creator you're a great builder you've done a lot of studying i, I like to believe that humans are nothing more than the combination of bricks and these bricks are made up of skill sets you are who you are today because you stacked skills in a very unique way that create alex's building so did i so did every other builder in the space for you today, you speak a lot about skill acquisition, going full-time Web3, working in Web3, monetizing Web3. What would you say is the ultimate skill stack that one should focus on today if their goal is to build a thriving, prosperous career in the Web3 space? The more I learn, the more I realize my deficiencies, if that makes sense. like it, it, It's very much the yes, Dunning-Kruger yes. effect where at the beginning, uh, it's funny, like even... Even like early on, like from like 23 to 25, I started to feel like I really understood. Like I felt like I had the, the universe locked down. Like I'm like, I get this. Like I, I'm, uh, I'm entrepreneurial. <laughs> like um, I've got like a different spirit and a different mindset. But then what's really cool about running a project or running a business is there's an honesty to it in that if you suck at something, you're going to find out and you need to get better quickly. Um, but then there isn't just like things that you need as like a baseline. Like when it comes to running any sort of company or business, the hardest lessons to learn are always hiring, managing. These are the things that I think very few are prepared for in such a formal sense and you learn through experience. But in terms of active skill stacking, I'm actually, I'm extremely aggressive and specific with the skills that I'm trying to acquire. And I really think of skills from the perspective of which skills, uh, and for anyone that, uh, I know many people will be familiar with this concept, but I'm obsessed with the concept of leverage. And I'm like, which skill is going to give me the highest leverage? Meaning that per unit of input, 
which skill is going to give me the highest unit of output. So if you work for one hour and you get paid $50 an hour, that that's less leverage than if you get work for one hour and you get paid $500 an hour because you have some code base that does a, a task that takes most people 10 hours, but you're able to get it done in one and all of these um, ways of getting more output for input. So what I noticed was, okay, the highest leverage thing that I can create as in like the highest like magnifier on whatever I'm going to do, whether that be launch a, a, if I was to launch a new product like the Brain Boot, if I was to launch Web3 Jobs, this newsletter, if I was to um, try and get a, an opportunity at a speaking event, the highest leverage um, piece that I can build is my Twitter audience, right? And so, okay, Twitter is a, spoke, is a written medium. So what is the skill that I need to succeed on Twitter? Well, I need to get better at writing for social media, copywriting, writing in a way that is entertaining, connected, enjoyable to read. I, and I've even said to myself, if I learn no new skills this year and I only focus on getting better at copywriting, that will create way more outsized returns than anything else that I could possibly do. Like I, I, someone I study a lot is NFT God. And even six months ago, he was really good at copywriting. But you'll have noticed, like if you follow his content, that he in the past like three or four months has just gotten so good at breaking the regular formats that we're used to seeing. Like there's so if you go on X or Twitter, like it feels like you sometimes see the same templates, the same recycled like philosophies and all these pieces again and again and again. And copywriting for him just separates him out from everyone else. You, whether you love him or hate him, he's different and he stands out. And that is so underrated. And now that I've accumulated enough of a following, I just look at it like, okay, if I just focus on getting better at writing copy, I will grow faster. And if I grow faster, the size of the opportunities will get better. The other things that I think about a lot is I'm starting to get better. This is a skill that not, not many people talk about is delegation and automation. And it's something that I've only become obsessed with in the past couple of weeks. If you have 40 hours per week to go back to this idea of leverage, let's say I'm gonna use even like a pretty like entry level rate. Let's say your rate working for a company is $25 an hour, but you can delegate a task to someone who might be uh, overseas who might be working for $15 an hour. And in some instances, if you're getting paid even more like 50, 60, 100 higher rates, right? If you value your time at those rates, you can take the work that might take you five hours and give it to someone else who actually might be better at that work. And they might get it done in three hours, right? And you've just bought back those five hours and so something like to use a concrete example with my newsletter, with my jobs newsletter, for anyone that doesn't know, I just send out a bunch of links to all the latest jobs that are available in Web3. It's very simple. When I went to write the first one, I realized it was going to take me 15 hours to research every one of these links and categorize them and put them into a format. So what I did was I was like, this is something that I can see a way that it could become self-sustaining in the future and I'm happy to invest in it. I'm going to invest in the research part of this. So now I pay someone to do that research side. They do it over three days. They do five hours a day and I wake up and I'm ready to go to actually just go out and launch that newsletter. And so even though I've had a massive week this week, I actually sat down two hours ago and was like, all right, I've really got to get this newsletter ready. And thankfully, because I delegated that role, I actually am able to get it done in an hour rather than 15 hours. And so the, the more that you can find these opportunities to create leverage, and if it doesn't always have to be delegation. The other side is automation. With the writing side of what I created, if anyone's seen the video on my pin profile tweet, I knew that it would also take me several hours to format this newsletter. So what I did was I created a spreadsheet automation that took all the data in the spreadsheet and formatted it in the way that I wanted my newsletter to be presented in a Google Doc. Then I just take that information, pull it across into the newsletter platform, and literally in five minutes, it's ready to go. I've used two forms of leverage here. I've delegated and I've automated. And by doing that, I've given myself back somewhere between 15 and 20 hours a week, which isn't actually 15 or 20 hours of work that I would have done. It just would have been impossible to do that, that amount of work. And so I, I'm now just obsessed with looking for these opportunities. And I actually wrote a post about it earlier today. The way to find these opportunities is you don't realize there are things that you're doing every single day that you do every single day. Like you have repeated tasks that you're not paying attention to the fact that they're repeated. 
And often, and people think, oh yeah, but I'm the only person that knows how to do this. It's crazy, but most of the times you're actually not. If you just record a loom video of yourself doing the task and write the problems and write the data sources and write what you need to send to a client, you can have someone package all of that who's more skilled than you at that specific task and they'll get it done faster and cheaper and then you can focus on doing the important work that is really either buys you back your time so you can just be happy or so that you can do more of the high impact work. That cup of coffee you were sipping on, was that also uh, delegated and automated? I wish. This is a peppermint tea because in the afternoon I need I need tea. Otherwise, I'm not going to sleep. But um, yeah, it's funny. Like I've literally got this now. I, I think about it every single day. I'm like I'm like on high alert for something that I'm just like, okay, this needs to be a template. This needs to be automated. This needs to be yeah. um, delegated or not even this needs to be just... I wonder if this could be, I'm going to write up a brief. I'm going to spend 10 minutes writing a brief. I'm going to put it on Upwork and I'm going to see if anyone comes back and really feels like they can solve the problem. And half mm. the ones I, I say no to and half the other ones I'm now starting to consider. I'm like, oh, that actually would be awesome to automate each week. Let's say you were helping people grow on Twitter. That was your thing, right? Like if half your time is spent booking coaching calls and writing proposals and um, sending emails and booking appointments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you find in an eight hour workday, you've spent six hours not doing sales then and one hour coaching yeah. and then one hour doing sales. What if you inverted that? So you did six hours of sales, one hour of coaching, and then um, the other hour was obviously probably managing those processes. It's management. You'd be a machine. Like it's crazy. How different would the business be? Yeah, completely different. But the next skill set that I want to stack is I want to learn sales a little bit better. I consider myself um, a decent marketer, um, but I want to learn sales. But the reason I don't focus on it right now is if we think about it from a leverage perspective, copywriting is one to many, right? Like if I write better copy, I might be able to reach 100,000 people. Sales is usually, except in the context of maybe a video, um, but sales is usually one to one. And so if I am a 10 to 10 X better marketer, I might reach, um, as I said, like a hundred thousand more people. But if I'm a 10 X better salesperson, if I have something where I'm, I'm making sales, I might close three, like instead of two sales a day, I might close four sales a day. And let, let's use this. If I was to take sponsorships for web three jobs or something like that, like if I, if I was able to close four sponsorships in a day instead of two, it's like, yeah, that's great. But if I had, 30 times the leads coming in kind of like what you were saying about um making videos if i had 30 times the leads coming in then you don't actually need to be a salesperson you don't even need to negotiate anything you just take the low-hanging fruit that's easy and you just move on and so that's why i until i feel confident enough as a copywriter i don't really want to learn these next skills like sales etc because I, I think it's it's lower on the leverage scale, even though it's important. So we got copywriting, delegation, automation, sales. Would, is there anyone you would any other skill you would add there? I wouldn't say skill, but I would say I actually think the uh, I hate when people say things like this. I think the most important thing is mindset, right? I think a lot of people, and I'm a victim of this too. I think a lot of people see other people succeeding on Twitter, and it's, it's really easy to feel bad about yourself when you see that. Like I even have people message me and they're like, wow, Alex, you're killing it. All these companies are paying you to um, post their jobs. I've never been paid to post a single job. That's just what it looks like because I'm sharing jobs of companies. And like, that's what happens when you look at the external side of, of the way people um, are just participating in this ecosystem. We kind of like magnify how well other people are doing and make ourselves feel bad about how we're doing. And I think everyone should know that every single creator is just figuring it out on the fly. Like we're all figuring it out. We're all learning together. Um, most of us, like a lot of the time feel like we, we figured it out and we we're killing it and now we've lost it and it's never going to work again. Like, I can't tell you the amount of times I've mentally right. felt like, oh, I just got lucky. Like I got lucky on those few threads. I'm actually not very good at this. I don't know if I have it in me, but the mindset you need to have I've found is you need to be willing to keep putting out content even when it's not performing. And what I've learned is the way to do that is 
and I've had to train this muscle like over a year because it's still tough. You need to learn how to mentally reward yourself and put the dopamine into the fact that you're doing the work, like into the process, not the outcome, which is really hard because what happens is when eventually you do have that blow up moment, like a lot of people, and it can take ages before it happens. But when you have that blow up moment, you're going to, you do so, you might do so well compared to how you've done in the past. And then your brain is going to go anything that isn't at this standard. It's like, oh, I've lost it. Like I can't go viral ever again. Like I can't do it then you need to switch your mindset back. You need to put the love into the process. You need to reward yourself for the process. Like this week, for example, I've been a little bit backlogged and I haven't gotten out as many posts as I would like to. And I don't actually look at the likes or the comments or anything like that anymore. I just feel good or bad about have I hit, have I gotten my 10 job posts out? Mm. Have I gotten 40 tweets out? Have I gotten five long form tweets out? Like one every single morning um, with my morning coffee. And if I've done that, I don't care where I sit on the NFT inspect scale. I don't care where I sit, like how much my follower growth has been. I don't care about any of that because I know I'm hitting the bar that I set for myself. And so I think um, the two things that people really need to understand if you're going to become a creator led business or a creator, you want to be a creator, you want to start a business, you want to start a creator led business is you need to understand that 99% of the time of making content, it doesn't feel like it's working and that's okay. And that's what it feels like for everyone. And that you need to love, like every time you've switched your brain to focusing too much on outcomes, you need to bring it back to focusing on the pro- on the, the the process and rewarding yourself for how you perform in the process. Oh man, I appreciate you saying that. That was a lot of value. As a closing, closing thought, a lot of people... Uh, here today that are watching this content are looking to go full-time web3 or they're looking to unlock opportunities looking to build businesses what would be your top recommendations for them to get the placement that they deserve or that their skill set allows to it's a really good question my answer to that is um i actually put out a, a post about this yesterday i believe which is i think the number one thing is apply to more jobs i see a lot of people who tell me they applied to like let's say a job at polygon and they're like i haven't heard back um, and they're freaking out and they might send me a message like, how do I how do I get this job to happen? And what I've learned is like the average job really gets roughly like 30 to 40 applicants. So if you think about that from a numbers perspective, you probably need to apply to 30 to 40 jobs at least before you actually find that role. And so it's kind of similar to yeah. the content perspective, which is I think don't be too disheartened if it doesn't work immediately. Just apply to like three or four jobs a week and do that over several weeks. If you can do more, amazing. But I think that's a pretty manageable load for a lot of people. And kind of think of it like dating or sales or anything like that, where it's like you can't put too much pressure on the one to be the one that works. You need to kind of have like a a broad approach to a confident and broad approach to the way that you're going out into the world. And then I think you'll find that you have a little bit more success with it. But some practical advice that I think will elevate people to stand out amongst the rest is generally speaking, whenever I get um, requests, because people kind of see me, think I'm the recruiter for some of these companies when they've been coming through. (laughs) And I see people send me like a big um, message about their experience and everything that they've worked on. Most hirers and recruiters like they get so many applicants and they're tired and they're like you got to think about the person on the other side right like it's the end of the day they're not really looking too closely at it they've never seen um, an individual before so you want to do the things that stand out and the number one thing that i find stands out is if you've worked for a brand that is recognizable and even this in itself is is a hard thing to hustle but if you can hustle any form of social proof whether that be to volunteer for a reputable NFT project, a reputable brand or a reputable creator, even just for a month, right? And say, hey, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'd love to help out. Is there anything I can do to help? They'll probably only have two or three hours of work a week, uh, of work, two or three hours of work per week for you. But what's great is at the end of that, you can slap Polygon onto it or Goblin Town or whatever you want onto your resume. And that will help you the next time you do that. And if you do that once or twice and almost look at it like you're doing university, right? Like you're getting some level of accreditation on your resume. When you go to apply for that proper job, the paying job, the one that fits your skill set, when everyone else has no experience in Web3, it'll say, 
oh, Alex was working in the community team at Goblin Town. That's actually like really um, something that w- separates him compared to the other candidates. Let's at least have an interview with him and hear about that. Um, and so I think that's something that most people are missing that is a low hanging fruit that if you hustle in the same way you go for a job, you can probably get. And so I know it's unpopular to say work for people for free, but if I really feel that if you can um, treat it almost like a university experience, like a one month boot camp or a two month boot camp, not only will you get the brand name, you actually will learn a lot about how these projects actually work, who the decision makers are. Um, and how um, they delegate work and you will genuinely be more equipped for a web3 job man this was great so it's alex's building on x bricktopians by law degree on OpenSea or your favorite marketplace other than those three things where can people find you i have one extra newsletter so i have two newsletters one to help you get a job and i got one more which is um where i share really intimately the the skills that i'm trying to build the lessons i've learned and just things that i know can help accelerate people's journeys so it doesn't take eight years like it has for me so if you want to check that out i'll send that through as well leon i think um for more of the entrepreneurs in the space the, they'll get a lot of value out of that and it's actually my favorite thing to create that. every week i love it like i sat down this morning to create it and it's like that one zone where you don't think about an algorithm, you don't think about anything else. It's like, I can just fully be myself within it. So um, right. would love for anyone to check that out. Um, I really enjoy creating it. Um, but yeah, for the most part, uh, the thing I always love to say is like, I check all my DMs. So if you ever need any help at all, just always feel free to send me a DM. And I'm always happy to respond and, and give a little bit of help. Alex, thank you, man. Thank you, Leon.